Canadians have always played a very important part in the entertainment industry, whether that be in theatre, music, TV, and of course, movies. Some of the most recognizable faces and names in entertainment today are Canadian. But many would probably be surprised to know that Canadians were there at the very beginning, at the birth of the film industry, before Hollywood was even an idea. And not just as actors and actresses, but as writers, producers, and directors, from those that worked from behind the scenes to the heads of some pretty big studios. But in today's video, I would like to concentrate on the women, the Canadian actresses. Some you may have heard of, others you probably haven't. But nonetheless, all their contributions were important. Now let's go back to the very beginning of film. Let's go back to the silent movie era. I was wondering who I should introduce first in this video, and I decided upon May Irwin, who is considered to be the very first Canadian actress on film. May was born Georgina May Campbell on June 27, 1862 in Whitby, Ontario. May's father passed away when she was 13, so her mother put May and her sister Flo on stage to help pay the bills. Singing under the name the Irwin Sisters, the girls became quite popular, even making it to the stages of New York. But May had a natural comedic talent and moved easily to the stages of vaudeville. In 1896, May would be chosen to appear in the first film ever to be shown to the public commercially. The film titled The Kiss was produced at Edison Studios, touted to be the first film studio in the United States. The film was the reenactment of The Kiss that she shared with fellow actor John Rice in their stage musical The Widow Jones, and it was the very first kiss captured on film. The total length of the film ran only about 18 seconds long, but that 18 seconds upset many as it was still considered immoral to kiss in public. So immoral the Catholic Church denounced this very short film and warned others they would pave their way to hell if they saw it. This film made May a true pioneer. The Library of Congress 103 years later would deem the kiss culturally significant, and in 1999 it was selected for preservation. May would marry for the first time in 1897 to Frederick Keller, but sadly he passed away just seven years later. May would have only two other credits to her name on film. In 1905, she appeared in the film The Whole Damn Family and the Damn Dog, and in 1914's Mrs. Black is Back, playing Mrs. Black. Most of this film was shot in her own home in New York. But May was not resting those nine years between her last films. She was enjoying a very successful theater and vaudeville career and even became a songwriter. May would marry again in 1907 to Kurt Einsfeld, who was her manager. May would continue to perform, including on the stages of Broadway, but as she got older, she decided to take a retirement. May passed away on October 22, 1938, at her home in New York City. Florence Lawrence, known as the first movie star. Florence Annie Bridgewood was born January 2, 1886 in Hamilton, Ontario. Florence was destined to perform from the very beginning. Her mother, Charlotte Bridgewood, was a professional stage actress, performing under the name Lotta Lawrence. Lotta would take little Florence with her as she traveled to perform. Then she came up with an idea. Lotta changed Florence's surname also to Lawrence and put her on stage as Baby Flo, the child wonder whistler. Florence would spend the next years touring with her mother and appearing in theater. But in 1907, when she turned 21, 
She would start her film career by appearing in Daniel Boone Pioneer Days in America. Daniel Boone was a movie short produced by Edison Studios. Her mother also had a short part in the film. Next, Florence would join the Vitagraph Company of America, where she worked with J. Stuart Blackton and actor-director Charles Kent. In 1908, she joined the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company, and she would appear in most of the 60 short films they made that year. All 60 of those films were directed by someone who was also fairly new to the film industry, none other than D. W. Griffith who had become one of the most influential directors in cinematic history. Florence was quickly becoming a fan favorite, and audiences wanted to see her in more films. But the Biograph Company had an anonymity clause for all their actors, where they would not have their names used in any of the credits in the films. So Florence became known as the Biograph Girl. Florence also met and worked with her first husband at the Biograph Company, actor Harry Salter. They would marry in 1908. With Florence's growing popularity and the demand for her in films, she started pushing back at the studio. She demanded more money and saw how she could rise even more as an actress if she could finally use her name and get credit. It seems she pushed them a little too hard, however, because her and Harry were fired in 1910. Next, they met and were hired by Carl Lamley, who just created the Independent Movie Company, or IMP for short. He saw the potential in Florence, but to really get her into the public eye under his studio's name, he decided to pull a publicity stunt. One of the first of its kind, but certainly not the last. Anonymously, Carl had started a rumor that Florence had been killed in a streetcar accident. Then when the rumor reached its peak, he then counteracted his own propaganda by taking out ads in trade magazines with the caption, We Nail a Lie. He used this opportunity to announce the Biograph Girl was now the Imp Girl, and also to publicize her name. He also continued the propaganda by claiming the lie was being circulated by his enemies of his studio. This stunt, no matter how devious, made Florence and the Imp Studios famous, and finally everybody knew her name. A couple of years later, however, in 1912, Florence found herself in jeopardy of being replaced as the studio's top star by another actress none other than fellow Canadian Mary Pickford. So Florence and Henry made a move to Lubin Studios, but after a short period with them, they decided to open their own studio, the Victor Film Company. This would make Florence one of the first women ever to be the head of her own film studios. That venture, however, would be a short one. A couple years later, in 1913, they sold the studio to Universal Film Studios. It was during this period that Florence was not only contributing to the film industry, but soon she would contribute to the automotive industry. After buying her first car in 1913, she became a passionate automobile enthusiast. But she thought that the automobile should be made safer, so she switched from being an actress to an inventor. She invented the very first turn signal, called an auto signal arm. She soon added an indicator for a full stop. It's raised or lowered by the driver when they pressed on the brake. But sadly, Florence never obtained a patent for her inventions, so she never got the full credit. Perhaps influenced by her daughter's inventiveness, Florence's mother would be co-inventor to the first windshield wipers in 1917. She did have a patent, but she never did get the credit either. After Universal Studios bought Florence and her husband out, she went to work for them. But in 1915, during the filming of Ponds of Destiny, a large fire broke out in the studio. While trying to help another actor to safety, Florence got badly burned, fell, and fractured her spine. 
and although the fire happened at their studios, Universal refused to pay her medical bills for the whole year that she was lying in bed in pain. Still under contract and needing the money to help out with those bills, Florence returned to Universal in 1916 to film The Elusive Isabel. Also that year, Florence and Harry were having many issues in their marriage, so Florence filed for divorce. In 1920, Harry would pass away after having a stroke. He was only 42 years old. Florence would not make another full-length movie until 1922's The Enfoldment. She would make another 20 films between 1922 and 1937. Florence would also marry twice more. In 1921, she would marry Charles Woodring, but they would divorce 11 years later in 1932. Florence would start dating Henry Bolton a few months after her divorce from Charles, and they married in 1933. That marriage lasted only a few months, as Henry was an abusive alcoholic. He ended up beating her severely, so she ended their marriage. Florence's last appearance on film was sadly in a minor role in 1937's Night Must Fall. And after all she went through earlier in her career, fighting to get her and other actors the rights to have their work credited to their names, it was an uncredited role, as most of her last appearances on film were. But sadly, that happened to many silent movie actors. They found it very hard to transition to the sound era. Florence made over 300 films and movie shorts since 1908 in her career, but the dawn of the sound era was definitely not kind to her. On December 28, 1938, Florence's neighbor heard her crying for help. The neighbor rushed over and when she saw Florence, she immediately called for an ambulance. The ambulance rushed Florence to the hospital, but sadly, they couldn't save her. Florence had purposely taken a mixture of ant paste, a poison to kill ants, mixed with syrup. Florence had left a tragic note behind, with her intentions and her goodbyes. Some say her cries for help after taking the deadly concoction was to get attention so her body would be found. Others say those heartbreaking cries were actually of regret. Actors of today should be thanking Florence, for she fought for the right of actors to be recognized for their work, paving the way for them to become stars, giving their names power. She helped make drivers and their families safer on the road through her inventions, inventions that she never got credit for. So next time you're out for a drive and you signal to turn, think of Florence Lawrence, the first movie star. Josephine Crowell. Josephine Bonaparte Crowell was born January 11, 1859 in Nova Scotia. You may have noticed her middle name. Legend says she was indeed named after Josephine Bonaparte, wife of Napoleon. Sadly, little is known about her childhood. We do know she was working in the theater in 1879 and eventually moved into vaudeville where she worked for years. Josephine would eventually hear the call of the Broadway stage, and in 1902 she appeared in the hit show Captain Molly as Molly's mother. She was 43 years old. As with many actresses that appeared on Broadway, she moved to the fledgling film industry. 1911's Her Mother's Sin is credited for being her first recorded appearance on film. But sadly, this is thought to be one of the many lost films from the silent era. She appeared in many film shorts between 1911 and 1914, but would have her first major role in 1914's Home Sweet Home with Lillian Gish. She played the mother to the fiancé 
of Lillian Gish's character. Josephine would be very busy between 1914 and 1915, appearing mainly as the mother in film shorts credited as Mrs. Crawwell. In 1915, both Josephine and Lillian Gish would appear alongside many other stars of the silent screen in the movie Birth of a Nation. This movie was one of the highest grossing films of the silent era and one of the most controversial movies of all time. She would continue to play mother in matron roles until her next big part in 1916. It would be yet another film directed by D.W. Griffith called Intolerance. Josephine would play Catherine de' Medici. This was also yet another film she would appear beside Lillian Gish. Intolerance ran almost three hours and it was considered to be one of the great masterpieces of the silent era. It intertwines the story of a woman who is separated from her husband and child due to prejudice with stories of other intolerance through history. Time periods included in the film are Ancient Babylon to the story of Jesus Christ, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France, and back to modern America, modern according to the time the film was made. The large and impressive sets were some of the first of its kind, and D.W. Griffith spared no expense. And he spared no expense on the huge battle scenes. In fact, in one battle scene, in one day, 60 extras were injured. Josephine made quite an impact. 1917 would come her next notable role in Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, starring another Canadian, Mary Pickford. There would be a small uncredited role in this movie played by a nine-year-old boy who went by the name of Milton Burrell. Josephine found steady work and her face was very recognizable on the big screen. She had no trouble finding parts. In 1924, she would star beside popular comedian Harold Lloyd, playing his mother-in-law. The movie, Hot Water, helped showcase Josephine's comedic talent. In 1925, Josephine would appear beside two of the most popular actors of the time, a young John Gilbert and Mae Murray. The movie was called The Merry Widow, and Josephine would play Queen Melina, mother to the prince, John Gilbert. This would prove to be yet another box office hit that Josephine was a part of. Josephine, at the age of 66, had a steady career in movies and short films. In 1928, four years later, she would play another queen, Queen Anne, in Victor Hugo's The Man Who Laughs, besides such names as Mary Philbin and Conrad Veidt. The Man Who Laughs today is considered a cult classic. And movie legend says that the character played by Conrad Veidt was the inspiration for the Joker in the Batman comics and movies. In 1929, when the sound era was becoming more popular, she would make her last appearance on film. It was a film short starring Laurel and Hardy and it was called Wrong Again. Sadly, as with many of the actresses of the silent screen, Josephine found it hard to move into the sound era. So she decided to retire from acting at the age of 70. Josephine only married once to French actor Emile Lacroix. She lived a relatively quiet life after her retirement. But only three years later, on July 27, 1932, she passed away at her home in Amityville, New York. Josephine started her film career later in life, but through her work on almost a hundred films and movie shorts, including some of the biggest and most popular productions of the era, her contribution to the birth of the movie industry will live on. Marie Dressler. Marie was born Lila Korber on November 9, 1868 in Coburg, Ontario. When she was five years old, she was already performing on the stage. 
When she was 14, she was acting with a small theater company in Lindsay, Ontario, but she realized she wanted more opportunities in the theatrical world. In this era, acting was considered a job of ill repute. So she changed her name to spare her family the embarrassment of having an actress for a daughter. Marie would later join the Bennett Moulton Opera Company, where she was able to hone her skills. As she grew as an actress, her natural comedic talent and wit got her noticed. She soon landed a role on Broadway in the production Nicotine opposite of the famed actress Lillian Russell. Next would come her big break, when she was cast opposite Charlie Chaplin in 1914's Tilly's Picture Romance, cast as Tilly. It was so popular that she made two more Tilly films. Marie had steady work and was in demand not only for her comedic and acting talent, but for her presence on the big screen. She starred alongside such actors and actresses as Norma Talmadge, Marion Davies, Rudy Valley, Bessie Love, Jack Benny, Greta Garbo, Lillian Gish, and fellow Canadian Norma Shear. When Marie turned 60, she was the highest earning film star and one of the top box office draws. In 1931, at the age of 63, she won an Academy Award for Best Actress for her role in the comedy Men and Bill. In 1933, she co-starred in Dinner at Eight alongside such names as John and Lionel Barrymore, Jean Harlow, and Wallace Beery. Also in 1933, she was the very first Canadian woman to be featured on the cover of Time magazine. 1933 would also be her last movie role as Abby in Christopher Bean. Unknown to most of her co-stars, Marie had been battling cancer and she sadly lost her fight on July 28, 1934 in Santa Barbara, California. Not only was Marie a great comedic talent and actress, but she was also a writer and director, and it was said that Hollywood fell into grief at her passing.